So let's see, the midterm is the Thursday after fall break. Um, we want to go back to Okay, so does anybody have a question about chapter four that he or she would like to get? All right. Um, so let's see. I've gone through the uh, theory of this twice. Um, uh, I think I have two things to add. One is there's a typo in the fluorophore example. Tor should be 1 over tor in the first equation. But um, I'll, uh, I'll fix that and add it to the typo list. It's actually only the second or third typo that I found in the second edition. Um, Let's see, what was the other thing I was going to say? Uh, I'm afraid I forgot. Um, maybe, maybe what I'll do is, since I've been through the theory of this twice, maybe I'll do some examples on the blackboard from chapter from this chapter on Fourier and Laplace transforms. Oh yeah, the other thing I was going to say is, remember I said that we, we computed the Fourier transform of a, um, of a convolution and found it was the product of the Fourier transforms. Well, it turns out that the Laplace transform of convolution is also the product of the Laplace transforms. But uh, deriving that, um, I think requires complex variable theory, so I'm going to postpone the derivation to, and I'll defer it to the section on the chapter on complex variable theory. Um, so let me, let me turn the lights on and maybe do some uh, some examples and. I, I think I'm going to do the example partly on the blackboard and partly projected. Um, the first example I'm going to do on the blackboard, namely, this is one that I did in the problem session, but um, it's so important that I want to um, that it's that it's worth uh, illustrating on the blackboard here. This is just the Fourier transform of a Gaussian, and the important thing is that it's a Gaussian. Um, and that's something that comes up all the time in physics classes. Um, so we have e to the minus m squared x squared. The other reason for doing this example is it illustrates a, a technique that's enormously important namely completing the square. So what we do is we rewrite this as e to the minus m squared x plus alpha squared. And we're going to choose alpha so we get these two terms. And then we're going to cancel the alpha squared term. So there, I've canceled the alpha squared term, no matter what alpha is. And now I'm going to choose alpha so as to get the linear term. Well, the linear term in that exponential is minus m squared x 2x alpha. That's the cross term. And we want that to be minus i k x. And so that means that alpha should be i k over 2 m squared, if I haven't made a mistake. Minus signs cancel, 
i k over two m squared. So that means that this thing, that this thing here, is m squared alpha squared is m squared i k squared over four m to the fourth. So this thing is e bringing this factor forward since it doesn't involve x. It's going to be e to the minus k squared over 4 m squared. The m to the 4th is partially canceled by the m squared. Now, it turn, the, 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 the amusing thing about this completing the square, which um, works in many contexts, including path integrals, by the way, um, the amusing thing is that, and, and Laplace transforms, um, is that this term turns out to be the most important part of the full answer. What's left is just going to be a number. All the k-dependence is here. So what do we have left? What we have left is minus infinity plus infinity dx over root 2 pi e to the minus m squared x. Now what's alpha? Alpha is i k over 2 m squared squared. Oh god, look at that handwriting. Um, let me just check. Yeah, that's right. So, um, what happens? Well, if this were a real number here, because you're integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity, you should not hesitate to just display, change variables to x x minus alpha, and then you can forget about alpha, because you're still integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity. In this case, it's imaginary, and in, when we do complex variable theory in a couple of weeks, we'll learn that we can also finesse that. Uh, so, we forget this term. And what do we have left? What we have left is just a Gaussian integral, so it's a number. And the number happens to be such that when we finish all this, it's 1 over square root of 2 m e to the minus k squared over 4m squared. So as I, as I said to you earlier, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. The Gaussian is essentially this term that you put in to cancel the alpha, the alpha square in completing the square, and the rest of it is just a number that comes out in the wash. So there, there are many lessons there. You should you should dwell on them until until you're bored with them. I mean, make sure you understand them because they're things that are extremely useful. Will be extremely useful to you later in life. Later in your physics life. Perhaps not the rest of you. Okay. Um, all right. Let me. I'm going to. I'm going to redo an example that I um, did. I don't know if I did it in class or in the problem session. But let me just show it to you again. Um, remember the recipe for dealing with the delta function of g of x is it is a sum over the zeros. So, so there might be several of them. I'm labeling them by k, although k is not a good variable here. Let's say i. Uh, it's delta then of x minus x zero i, and in each case it's divided by the absolute value of the derivative of g at x zero i. Notice that this formula only works if the derivative is non-zero. If the derivative is zero, then uh, things are more complicated, and that's discussed in example 4.4 which I encourage you to read and study, but I don't think we need to 
go over it in class. So in particular, the example I wanted to show you was, this is something that comes up in uh, field theory, uh, electrodynamic, classical electrodynamics, quantum electrodynamics, quantum field theory, and so forth. We wind up with a delta of k0 squared minus k vector squared minus m squared. So what is this? Well, it's going to be, we have to take the derivative of this. And so the derivative, it'll be delta of k0 minus k0. This is a quadratic equation, so there are going to be two solutions. Uh, over, the derivative of this is just 2k0, so you take the absolute value of 2k0, 1, plus delta k0 minus k0, k0, 2, divided by the absolute value of, two, of 2k0, 2. And the k0s here obviously are k0 is plus or minus the square root of k squared plus m squared. This, by the way, is the formula for the energy of a particle in terms of its momentum and its mass, a relativistic particle. And um, here I'm using what are called natural units. Would you like me to try to explain natural units so you are happy with them? Yes, no? I see one no. All right, we'll skip it for now. In any event, there, uh, it was Feynman who championed this, uh, the use of natural units. And um, after a while, it became universal. And I once attended a lecture on string theory, which the guy um, said, um, he's going to say, uh, H bar C. Newton's constant, Boltzmann's constant, uh, pi, i, and, and square root of 2 all equal to 1. And so this was a very qualitative talk. Um, he, he was obviously an amusing one for us. All right, now what I'm thinking of going through is some of the stuff on quantum mechanics, but um, it, it's useful in that it makes a contact, makes contact, contact for you between um, the formalism, the elementary formalism of quantum mechanics and a more sensible form, the more sensible formulas of formalism that Dirac gave us. But, on the other hand, the quantum mechanics is super basic. It's not more advanced than uh, free particles and uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty regulation. And it's, it's in the book. Do you want me to go through that on the board, or shall, shall we just blow it away? Or should I maybe do it on the screen? There are an awful lot of equations. I think I should do it on the screen if you want me to do it. You wouldn't mind? Yeah. All right. Okay, so let me let me do that. But as I said, if I'm going to do it on the board, it will it'll take the the rest of the boards and the rest of the day. All right. Let's see if we can go ahead to appropriate section. All right. Here we are. Um, So the idea is momentum and momentum space, and they, well, well, the formalism in elementary quantum mechanics is you write psi of x in terms of, well, actually, you write it this way in elementary quantum mechanics. You write it as psi tilde, so you may write it this way or you may not, I don't know, it depends. One way of writing it is psi tilde p over h bar over the square root of h bar, e to the i px over h bar dp over root 2 pi h bar. The way 
the simpler way of writing it as a Fourier transform is just to say it's phi tilde of k vi k x dk over root 2 pi. If we equate these two, and then we use Parseval's relation. Well, Parseval's relation says that if we normalize the integral of the absolute value squared of the wave function, which of course is just saying the particle is somewhere, certainly we don't know where, like my kidney stone, no idea where it is. Um, um, anyway, that's also the integral of the absolute value squared of the Fourier transform of the wave function, which is this. And now the Fourier transform of the wave function in this notation is, is, is that. Now if we switch to Dirac's notation, and um, as I've said to you many times, Dirac's notation is really a big help. Once you get used to it, it turns out that it will solve many things that otherwise are problems or theorems or lemmas. They're just transparent in Dirac's notation. Um, so here we have, th this relation here is just one is equal to the inner product of the ket with its corresponding bra. And what is that in a product? Well, if we insert the identity operator in this form, in between this bra and that ket, we get this. And that's the same as this, because the wave function is the inner product of the ket with an eigenstate of position, just as the momentum wave function is the inner product of the ket with an eigenstate of momentum. And that turns out to be, in terms of this psi tilde thing, it's psi tilde p over h bar the square root of h bar. I think this is useful because it um, shows you where, if you put in h bar, where, where the h bars go. But as I said, if if we were doing this in natural units, there wouldn't be any h bar at all. P and k would be equivalent to variables. Anyway, um, we can also insert the identity operator as an integral over p of an outer product of the eigenstate of, of momentum with the corresponding bra. We stick that in between the bra and the ket, and we get this expression here, no, I'm sorry, this expression, which we, 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 in, which we can interpret as the absolute value of phi of p squared. Now the inner product of any two states in Dirac's notation can be, again, if we insert the identity, x space identity operator, we get this. In ordinary notation, this in Dirac's notation, if we insert the identity operator in this form, we get this in Dirac's notation and this in ordinary notation. So all, all of these relations, as I said, Dirac's notation makes them transparent. Um, and the ordinary notation, it just you have to figure out every equation. Anyhow, the Fourier transform up there relating the wave function to momentum space, in momentum and position space um, is uh, this 4.62 up here and that is then, um, let's see, now I've gotten lost. I'm sorry, I've gotten Well, anyway, the, 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 the Fourier and inverse Fourier relations are these two, um, where this is the inner product of the ket with the, the x ket, and this is the ket with the, with the, of the phi ket with the p ket. And um, so this equation in Dirac's notation is this. You see, in Dirac's notation, it's just a very nice equation. And um, so that leads us to say that the in, this inner product is, is this. This is a very important formula. Um, uh, in 
natural units you can draw, set h bar equal to 1, but otherwise the thing to notice is that the phase here is e to the i px, not e to the minus i px, and there's a square root under it. And this is consistent with the delta function relation that the inner product of two position states is zero unless it's the same, because they, they represent the same position, and when they do, it's a delta function. It's, it's in infinite, and in, uh, so it's the, the inner product's a delta function. And if we insert the identity operator in the momentum space form, in between these two we get this, uh, we get this, because xp is that and py is that. And these are complex conjugates of each other apart from the interchange of x and y. And uh, that's equivalent to this when you just multiply the exponentials. And if you then change variables from p to k, you get a simpler expression. And now we recognize the direct delta function as this expression. Um, if we go back to this expression uh, here and differentiate the wave function with respect to x and multiply by h bar over i, we see that this pulls down a p from the exponential. We get this, and rewriting it somewhat, we can say, well, that's equivalent to having a p here, because if we look at this, um, or if we, as well, I said, it's equivalent to this, which is the same as that, if we insert a, the identity operator in terms of an integral over outer product of p prime momentum eigenstates. And then we evaluate these two, we get this expression here. Um, by the way, one of the, the you can reformulate um, a certain amount of quantum mechanics, you can make it look like classical mechanics. Um, you can say, well, classically we're not quite sure where everything is, so we're going to use a probability distribution. And that's like the probability distribution in quantum mechanics. And we would normalize the wave function that would give us the classical probability of where the particle is. The, the thing that's, that's really different about quantum mechanics from classical mechanics is, well, one formulation of it is this expression here. The, the idea that we have states that are vectors, that the inner products of states can be complex, and in particular, that they look like this, and that what's really going on is that the momentum operator generates translations in space, the energy operator generates translations in time. That's that and the the vector notation of quantum mechanics of what distinguish it from classical physics. Okay, the uncertainty principle, this is just an example of it. If we take a Gaussian wave function, we normalize it. Uh, there's the normalization. Uh, the mean value of an operator in a state is just the is just this. It's, you just take the Stay the operator and stick it between the bra and the cat. Uh, more generally, it's uh, the trace of the density operator representing the system times the operator. And you use a density operator when you don't know really what state the particle is in. It, you, if you have a density operator, then you know that. Um, there's a certain probability it's in one state, certain probability it's in another state, another probability it's in a third state, and so forth, depending on what the space is. And uh, 
oh, I see the new one off. Um, oh, we need that on, don't we? What am I supposed to do to get this thing on? Am I supposed to flash it with this? Uh, Does anybody know, I mean, one of you may know what I'm supposed to do to get this thing going. Sounds like it's turning back on. What? It has a fan going. It sounds like it's turning back on, maybe. Have one? It sounds like it's turning back on. Yeah, it's on. Right. It just has to warm up. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Tom. Um, I didn't touch the computer for a while, and the... Uh, the uh, projector just went dark, um, or it stopped. It, I, I should say, it stopped broadcasting the the signal, the image of the. Of the all right, thanks. I mean, it's really dumb. They shouldn't do that. So he's going to come. Uh, so while he's coming, I guess I can do some of this on the board. Um, In fact, um, I can say a couple of things that aren't in uh, aren't in the book. In other words, when I when I, what I said to you was a density operator is when you know that there's a certain probability, say P1, that the particle is in a state one. Another probability, P2, the particles in the state 2, and so forth, dot, 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 plus, say, Pn, the particle in the state n. So, um, uh, what once, in as much as it's got to be in one of these states, the sums of the Pi's, I equals 1 to n, has to equal 1. These things are obviously Hermitian. The P's being probabilities are positive, so the density operator is a positive Hermitian operator of unit of trace. And the uh, value of an operator, thanks, Tom. Really, there, this shouldn't happen, right? It should. Because yeah. One should be able to pause without the thing quitting. Yeah. Okay, so um, what's the mean value of the operator? Well, it might be in state 1. So in that case, it's P1, 1A1. That's the value of the operator if it's in the state 1. But it has probability P2 of being in the state 2. And the value of the operator A is the mean value of A in, in the state 2. And then we just keep adding them up, and we get Pn, N, A, N. And this is the same thing as the trace of rho times the operator A. Okay. Oh, he's finished. Okay. So, any questions about that? All right, so let me go back to the notes because of the screen because we can move more quickly. So, um, so that's why this equation is true and that's what this equation means. And um, the density operator is the most general description of things. In elementary quantum mechanics, we're we're always fixated on pure states. But pure states are exceptional. 
um, in real life in an experimental laboratory, one uh, almost never has anything like impurity. So mean value of the position operator is, is, is the position operator between the bra and the cat representing the state. So this is the pure state case. Um, the variance of an operator is the mean value of the square of the difference of the operator and its mean value. And um, there's a famous calculation that occurs here. If you take the cross product, you get minus 2a squared. And then the square of this is plus a squared. So altogether, it's the mean value of a squared minus the square of the mean value of a squared. Anyway. Um, So for the, for the particular case that I've been considering here, the mean value of x is zero, and so the variance of the position operator, which is this, is nothing more than that, or the integral of x squared times the probability that it's at x. And if you substitute for psi in this exponential, where's the f there, that exponential, and do the integral, you get, um, what now is now I've walked down the walls. You get this expression. If you take the Fourier transform of the wave function like this, and again, Dirac tells you how, and uh, you, this Px is this factor here, this thing is that. And, uh, and this thing is just the wave, the normalized wave function. You do the Fourier transform, you get that. You then compute the variance momentum space, you get h bar squared over a squared. You multiply them together, you get h bar squared over four. This is an example of Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. In this case, the product of the variances is as small as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle allows it to be. And that's because it's a simple Gaussian. Gaussians are lovely things, and um, they, they are minimum uncertainty relations. And in particular, coherent states um, also are minimum uncertainty states. Um, and. Um, that's part of the reason why lasers are so useful. Um, if we just look at the state of a particle at time zero, we can write it in terms of momentum eigenstates. Why? Because the operator that translates us in time is e to the minus i ht over h bar. And the momentum eigenstates are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And that just gives you this integral and um, one can then do the integral. Um, and one finds out what the wave function is at uh, an arbitrary time t. Okay, well the characteristic function, this is not that much to say. The probability distributions are normalized to one. The characteristic function is just the Fourier transform of the probability distribution. Expected values are mean values of things when weighted by the probability distribution and the moments in particular are x to the n times p and if you write p as uh, or x to the n p you rewrite p as um, a uh, well you, you you just look at what chi is and you differentiate and then set k equals zero you get this expression here. So the, the nth moment of the probability distribution is minus i to the n times the nth derivative of the characteristic function. So let's see, what else, what was the next thing I was going to say something about? Uh, well, I was going to say something about Feynman's propagator. Um, 
It's an example of a Green's function, and the more examples you see, the better off you'll be. Can you just turn it over, please, to over here? So um, the, the wave equation in this case is uh, d by d times squared minus Laplacian plus m squared. The Green's function, we write it as capital, this capital delta of x, and we want that to be a four-dimensional delta function of x. So this is the Green's function. Um, and this differential operator in particular, it's actually partial to partial t squared minus the uh, divergence of the gradient plus m squared. This is the relativistic generalization of the Laplacian. Now, we can solve this very easily. All we do is we remember, you know, once again, direct to the rescue. This is d fourth k over 2 pi to the fourth. Let's see, what did I use? E to the i kx, k dot x. Well, that's the end of it. Uh, and now what we want is we write this as a Fourier transform, so we write that as uh, d fourth k over, let's say, two, well, I don't know if we even bother with two pi to the four. Let's just call it delta of k, delta f of k, uh, e to the i k dot x. But now that has to turn into that when hit by this. And so in comes partial 2 partial t squared minus divergence of gradient plus m squared. And that has to give that. So what does this have to be? Well, this stuff hitting the exponential, it's obvious what it is because we can all differentiate exponentials. d by dt squared is minus k0 squared. Uh, the Laplacian there is minus k vector squared, but there's an extra minus sign, so this is k vector squared. And then we have plus m squared. So we've got all that e to the i k dot x, and we want it to equal this. So that means that this del times delta. So this means that this delta just has to be exactly that, namely minus k0 squared plus k vector squared plus m squared. And uh, yeah, that's right. By the way, in, in physics classes, there are in relativity, and this is true in special relativity and general relativity, there are two conventions. And um, it's kind of like the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, there's the convention where I'm using the convention k dot x is k vector dot x vector minus k zero x zero, x zero being t in natural units. The other convention is minus plus. The conventions are more or less, well, they're both extremely common. The conven this convention is used more often in general relativity. And it seems to me it obviously makes more sense because it has three plus signs and one minus sign. In particle physics, one often uses the opposite convention. Uh, and the reason for that is if you put the plus sign here and the minus sign there, then since this one is bigger, you get a quantity that's, if you're talking about a real particle, its energy is bigger than its momentum is equal to, or, well, I don't know, it's stupid because the two are equal, so you're going to get zero in either case. I don't know, it's just, it's a, it's a funny thing sociologically, there was a huge divide between particle physicists and people doing a study of gravity that started um, 
frankly, before I was born. So this is a long time ago. And um, it, I think the origin of it was that Einstein got so much press in, in the world and in the United States that the particle physicists were jealous. And uh, so they wanted to have nothing to do with him, and so they adopted a different approach. I don't know if that's actually the answer. But anyway, we now see that we can get this to work, and consequently, delta Feynman of x is integral t fourth k over 2 pi to the fourth e v i k dot x over uh, minus k zero squared plus k squared plus m squared. Now, people normally, people normally will write this as just k squared plus m squared, meaning that this is a four vector in a product, so it's k vector squared minus k zero squared, which is this. Now, this isn't quite Feynman's propagator because um, this thing can be zero at certain places, and how you treat the zeros, some subtleties about how you treat the zeros, um, uh, let me just do that. some subtleties about how you treat the zeros tell you um, how this thing generally behaves. And the, the, if you're talking about Feynman's propagator, then what you want is to put a small imaginary part here that tells you what to do. And we'll understand that. Um, it's minus i epsilon. We'll understand that when we do complex variable theory. All right, let's just see if I have anything else that I thought I thought to try to do. Yeah, this, uh, let me just correct the typo. In equation 4.135, it should be p of t, t prime should be 1 over tor e to the minus t minus tor prime, t minus t prime over tor times theta of t minus t prime. And that error propagates through the other uh, equations of this example. Yes. You said the error propagates, but after uh, I'm sorry, say it again. You said that the error propagates the equation, but then when you said cosine equals spike of uh, is that fixing the error? Well look, I don't know quite how it propagates. I, I haven't worked it out, but this should be one over two of that I'm sure of. Now how it goes through there, I don't know. I'll I tell you what, I'll 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 send the class a, a PDF. All right, um, I did an example in the, in, in the problem session of inverting a Laplace transform, but it actually involved complex variable theory, so maybe we should skip that and just postpone it to the chapter on complex variable theory. Um, I think then that we ought to start, unless there's another question, we ought to start um, the chapter on uh, infinite series. I think, I think this is actually a simpler chapter than um, what we've just been through. It's a bunch of definitions about convergence that you've probably seen. And frankly, it's just you should know about them, but we're not going to make a great deal of use of them. Um, it's just that we, we need to make definite what it is we're talking about um, 
So this is a sequence of partial sums. These are some numbers, let's say, complex in general. And um, this is a, a sum of the first capital N terms, of capital N plus one terms. And what we say is that this converges to a number S if S minus S sub N is less than epsilon for uh, N greater than some huge, some number capital N of epsilon. So no matter how small you give me an epsilon, I can find a capital N of epsilon such that when N is bigger than capital N of epsilon, the difference is less than epsilon. So that's just the standard definition of convergence. And we then say that um, S is equal to the sum N equals zero to infinity C sub N. So that's the conversion series. Now that's the nice case where it converges. Um, other uh, series um, oscillate or diverge, or I guess there's some that just wander. I don't know if I've ever seen one that actually just wanders, but um, I'm not sure that some must wander. Um, now you might, uh, what often, what sometimes happens, and that's a very nice series when this happens, namely, if um, the absolute value, if the absolute value of these terms also converges, then we say that this converges absolutely. So if then this thing converges absolutely. So absolute convergence means that if you replace all the terms by their absolute value, you still get convergence. And one thing that maybe is worth saying on the board, but I think I, if I'm going to make some progress here, I better uh, show you. There's a very simple thing that you should, you should do this with your fingers at home. 1 plus z plus z squared plus, plus z capital N. So you just imagine multiplying that out. And what you can see is this is 1 minus z to the capital N plus 1. And that tells us something, mainly that the partial sum of the first capital N terms of z to the n, so that's this thing, is equal to that divided by 1 minus z. So this is 1 minus z to the n plus 1 over 1 minus z. So this is a very nice recipe because this tells us if the absolute value of z is less than 1, then if you shoot capital N to infinity, this is going to go to 0, in fact, very fast. So that tells you that this thing converges to S. Sum n equals 0 to infinity, z to the n is 1 over 1 minus z if the absolute value of z is less than 1. So this, this is called a power series or a geometric series. And um, this is very, a very important example. And in particular, the theory of analytic functions is, is, is kind of about series that look like this. Um, I'm sort of overly simplifying it, but this is sort of the archetypical analytic function. All right, there are various tests of convergence. I think maybe I should go to the projector now um, in order to move a little bit faster. Um, so, Oh, you didn't get a candy. Who asked the question? Good catch. Um, so 
So let's see, we're in chapter So I've gone through this. So this is the geometric series business. So there are these various tests. One is if um, you can find an integer capital for any arbitrary small epsilon, you can find an integer capital n such that when you when n and m exceed that, the difference of the partial sums is less than epsilon. And that's Cauchy's criterion since he was French, something like Cauchy. But anyway, um, then there's a comparison test, which is really obvious. Uh, if we've got a convergent series of positive terms, and the absolute value of the C's is less than that, then this series converges absolutely. Okay. And moreover, if on the other hand, we've got a series of positive terms, C sub n and C sub n diverges, and so do the B's. Now here's something important, the Cauchy root test. And this is, if some, for some capital N, the term C sub n satisfy this criterion, for all little n bigger than capital N, then the, um, then since the sum of the x to the n are 1 over 1 minus x, that's the thing I just did on the blackboard, it follows by the comparison test that this sum of the cn's will converge absolutely. So basically what we've got here is a series converges absolutely if it satisfies this condition, or equivalently if it satisfies the condition Absolute value, of C to the, uh, absolute value of C sub n is less than or equal to x to the n, where x is less than 1. Then there's a ratio test of d'Alembert, which essentially follows from this. And it's that the series converges if the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of the term ahead minus the term uh, over the term is a ratio r, and that r is less than 1. And the reason this works is that if this is true, then you can say that this absolute value here is um, uh, differs from r by less than epsilon and you can make epsilon something like half the difference between r and 1, and then you can conclude that you're in, you're in the root test regime. Then there's an integral test, which is sometimes sort of comforting, namely that if you've got terms that are positively and monotonically decreasing, and f is a monotonically decreasing function, that happens to hit the CNs when X hits integral values, then um, you can write this inequality, and then the comparison test tells you that the series converges or diverges according to the integral, and so you just do the integral, or ask Mathematica, or Maple, or MATLAB, or as our friend here will tell us, maxima to do the integral, and then um, you, you just know what the answer is. Another thing is you use some program to do, do the sum. Now, this works if um, you write some program in Fortran, C, Python, whatever, and you sum the first 100 terms, the first 10,000 terms, the first million terms, and so forth, and you just judge by eye if it's converging, and you can, you can get a pretty good idea if it's going to converge in general. Now, we've been talking about just series of numbers. You can also have series of functions, and the idea is the same. Uh, so a series of functions converges to a function's f of z, 
S of Z on a set D, for every epsilon greater than zero and every Z in the domain D, there exists an integer that depends upon epsilon and Z such that S of Z minus S sub N is less than epsilon for all N greater than that. So that's the definition that's just copied from the definition of convergence of series of numbers. These numbers, S of Z and S, N of Z, S, S of Z and Z, may be real or complex. The function S of Z is said to be the limit on D of the convergent infinite series of functions, if, thing, if, if this criterion is, is met. Um, we say that the series converges uniformly on the domain D if you can choose the integers n of epsilon and z independently of z. So you have this equation. And the limit of an integral over a closed integral or uniform, that, that gives you uniform convergence. It means that convergence is uniform on the, on the set d. And if the set d is a closed integral, for example, and you have uniform convergence, then the limit of the integral of the function is equal to the integral of the limit of the functions. Um, so this is just a definition which is kind of obvious. That the function is square integrable if its Riemann or Lebesgue integral exists of the absolute value square of the function. And but the idea then is that a sequence of partial sums of square root of functions converges in the mean to a function s of x if this is true. So this is the definition of convergence in the mean, that um, the limit of the integral of the absolute value of the difference over the interval, that that limit is zero. And some people define it in a more sophisticated way with a weight function. I think we can skip that. Power series. Okay, well, when I was on that blackboard there, I said this the reason I did the geometric series on the blackboard is that it's so very important because it's an archetypical example of a power series. It's a power series where all the c's are equal to 1, all the c sub n is equal to 1. A more general power series is this S of z is this infinite series. So we use the ratio test, Dallin-Bass ratio test. And so we take CN, the n plus 1th term is Cn plus 1, Z the n plus 1, divide by the nth term, Cn, Zn. And the Z comes out, we get this. So the question is, so we define 1 over R to be this limit, n goes to infinity, of this absolute value of the, of the ratio. And then, um, what you've got then by the ratio test is that this will converge if the absolute value of z is less than r. So what we've got, we learned something very general here. If you have a power series, it may diverge everywhere, but if it converges, it will typically converge inside some circle of radius r. And the value of r is given by the inverse of this limit of success of the absolute value of successive terms. And within the circle, the convergence is uniform and absolute. Now, uniform and absolute, these are terms that make mathematicians' mouths water. So this is this is very nice. So this is why we love power theories. And and um, in fact, as we'll see when we do complex variable theory, which I think is the next chapter, um, analytic functions are basically defined in this way, and so we see that they converge uniformly and absolutely inside a certain circle to begin with, if they converge at all. And um, so here's just, I'm just saying that it, repeating the ratio test of the geometric series. It's a power series with all C is equal to 1, and in particular R is 1. That's an example that you can do on your own, and if you're an Elizabeth Warren supporter, you may 
enjoy the example. Actually, the sample doesn't illustrate anything bad about that. Okay, so you guys all, you guys know about n factorial, but there's, as is often the case, what you learn in college isn't necessarily the whole story. What I've got here is n factorial, various approximations to n factorial, divided by n factorial, and then multiplied by 10 to the a. And so we see the error in these various approximations. These are interesting approximations. Um, the, uh, this one, well, let's see. Let me go through these, the, the, the logic first, and then we'll come back to the graph. So n factorial, as you know, is just n, n minus 1, blah, 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 down to 1. That's n factorial. In a moment, we'll see why zero factorial has to be defined as unity. Now, a couple of centuries ago, Sterling invented this marvelous approximation for n factorial, and we'll derive it when we do complex variable theory, simple derivation. There was an Indian mathematician who was self-taught, by the way, and um, there's a movie about him. I don't remember the name of it, but it's quite a good movie. And uh, uh, of course, it doesn't do justice to the mathematics, but it, it's still quite a good movie. His name is uh, Ramanujan, and um, he invented a correction to Stirling's formula. And then a physicist at Cornell, um, I was once, by the way, on a bus at a conference, um, going from hotel to, to conference center. He was sitting behind me, and I was just sitting there, just thinking, blank mind. And he was talking to the guy next to him, and I just couldn't help listening. And I thought, God, that guy is very intelligent. Turned out to be David Merman. This is the Merman. Um, so he invented approximations that were even better than Ramanujan's and simpler. That's his first approximation. This is his second approximation. And then he invented an, an exact formula for an exact infinite product formula for uh, n factorial. Of course, the definition of n factorial is also an exact infinite product formula. So in a sense, the, he did not make a big deal about his infinite product formula. Um, and in fact, when I searched today for a reference for this, I almost, uh, I had a hell of a time finding it. I googled Merman's exact infinite product formula and the reference that came up was my book. Um, so, I don't know, it's, this has been lost sight of somehow. It was a 1984 paper in the American Journal of Physics. And let's look now at how good these are. Well, it turns out that Sterling's error is so big that it's off scale and I couldn't grab it. This is Merman's um, first approximation. Notice Ramanujan, wait, where's Ramanujan? I've got to get this straight here. There's Ramanujan and, okay, so I would say, Ramanujan is better than Merman's first, but not as good as Merman's second. And, um, all right. So anyway, these are approximations that you might want to um, keep track of. So as you know, the binomial coefficient is defined in this way. There is a, um, a Leibniz rule, which is actually, I think, a homework problem, or will be at some point. The nth derivative of a function, obviously, is the nth derivative of a function, but the nth derivative of the product of two functions, well, Leibniz worked out this formula for it. And that's one of the lessons of, of um, mathematics and physics, and it's that somebody in, makes a huge step forward and 
it turns out that people for the next 100 or 200 years typically make enormous use of the very simplest thing the guy did, namely Leibniz invented calculus, and so we learned from him how to integrate and differentiate. Same thing with Newton. But in fact, these people did far more than that, and in particular, he de derived uh, this formula for the product of two functions, the derivative product of two functions. There's the famous exponential series. You should become familiar with it. And with the, the it is a power series, and you can see if you apply the ratio test, it's the, uh, it converges inside a circle of infinite radius. Bessel series, it converges even faster. Now, double factorials. They're also useful, and the definition is you just go down by two instead of one, and if it's odd, you stop at one, if it's even, you stop at two. And now, what, what may surprise you is that zero double factorial and minus one double factorial are the both defined as unity. The minus one double factorial is quite surprising, I think. Okay, I'm going to repeat this. Uh, today is what? Thursday. All right, next Tuesday I'll repeat this because it's so important. Namely, the generalization of the factorial from integer values to complex values. And what you do is if you suppose z were an integer, then if you compute the integral e to the minus t, t to the n, dt, 0 to infinity, bingo, you get n factorial if, if z is an integer. But when z is complex, this integral is well defined, not for all values. In particular, it's not well defined if z is, say, minus 2 because of singularity at the origin and so forth. But this shows you why 0 factorial is 1. You just replace z by 0 and you get this integral, which is 1. Now, just to trip us all up, the mathematician defined gamma of z not as z factorial, which they should have done, but instead they defined it this way, so we get this extra shift of minus one. So z factorial is, is I'm sorry, gamma of z is z minus one factorial. And frankly, every time I have to deal with this, I have to look up the definition. I can never remember which one is which. Um, equivalently, z factorial is gamma of uh, z plus 1. And so gamma is this thing here. Now, you can play a trick integrating by parts uh, unless uh, z is pathological. The boundary terms vanish. And so gamma of z plus 1 has just a z here, minus d by dz, uh, doesn't, is just e to the minus t. You integrate by parts and you get this, and that pulls down a z. So now this is telling you that gamma of z plus 1 is z gamma of z. Well, you can keep playing the same game, and then you get gamma of z plus n is gamma of z is z plus n minus 1 gamma of z plus n minus 1, and that's gamma of z plus n minus 1 times, I'm sorry, that's z plus n minus 1 times z plus n minus 2 times gamma of z plus n minus 2. And so anyway, you eventually get that gamma of z plus n is this product down to z times gamma of z. And then you find that ratios of gammas uh, then are ratios of factorials, essentially, and consequently they're, they're products of things that you'd expect if, if gamma was nothing more than an ordinary factorial, factorial, factorial expression. And what you can do then is you can turn this equation on its head 
and then you can write gamma of z is 1 over z gamma of z plus 1, or 1 over z, 1 over z plus 1, gamma of z plus 2, blah, blah, blah. So now you see that gamma of z has poles of the negative integers. These, of course, were foreshadowed by this formula here, because when z is a negative integer, this t to the minus n is infinite when t is equal to zero. That's the origin of this. And um, so one gets this expression here. Now Euler worked out what that actually meant, and namely his formula is gamma z is the limit n goes to infinity of integer n factorial divided by z, z plus 1, z plus 2, up to z plus n, times n to the z. And then Weierstrass wrote things in, in an analogous way, but in terms of this thing called gamma, which is a constant that um, I defined, but I, I don't know if I skipped it in an example or if we'll define it later. It's Let's see, I think maybe I skipped it. So let me go back to, oh, oh my god, I went way, 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 way too far back. All right, well, I'll pick that up next time. Um, I'll start with the gamma function again, because you want to see that twice. And um, so then when we fin after we finish infinite series, uh, we can start complex variable theory, which is more important. All right, I guess we can stop for the. Uh